Coming to you live from NASA Community College on 90.3 WHBC and streaming live on the iHeart of the iTunes app. We can be seen in the studios right now on my Facebook live page and, of course, the Facebook of WHBC. Good morning, everybody. And if you post your name, we will be happy to give you a shout out right here on the uh, live program. And, of course, all those listening to us, we appreciate you taking time out on this Sunday. It is a very special Sunday. It is, believe it or not, the eve of another group of wonderful Jewish holidays. We just concluded Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And tonight begins the week of Sukkot, beginning on Monday and Tuesday, and then, of course, concluding next Monday and Tuesday with Shemini Atzeris and Simchas Torah. So here we are. This program is later archived on Spreaker.com. And hi there. In case you didn't know, my name is Rabbi Pearl. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This all depends on when you're listening or watching. And I want to say a very big special shout-out to uh, Yehuda Isaac Klein, Harvey Kipnis. How's your sukkah this year? And Joan uh, Jean Brandenstein, thank you so much to Jill, Jessic. Uh, her sister is listening to us on the radio. Oh, my God, that's fantastic. There are people listening on the radio. Shh, don't tell anybody. Hello, Abner, Abner Zarabi. Thank you. Nice to see you. And, of course, Yehuda is listening to us from the holy city of Williamsburg, Pennsylvania. Patty Fuchs, good morning to you and to uh, my very best to your mother and to the entire family. So today we're going to having in mind tonight is the holiday of Sukkos. For the next uh, seven, eight days, all of us spend time a lot of time, a short time, whatever, inside of a sukkah. So if you're going through a Jewish neighborhood, you will see from different places dotted around these kind of makeshift huts uh, in backyards, on uh, terraces, etc. It's called a sukkah. We're going to discuss right now why is the holiday of Sukkot this time of the year. Um, I just want to say a special shout out to Dr. Kil, uh, Dr. Kilshevsky. Thank you so Chag Sameach to you and to Bernard Kipnitovich. And uh, this gentleman, B- uh, Bernard, is actually, uh, it's afternoon in Nairobi. Now she, uh, he's listening to us from Nairobi. Now, can you imagine, my friends? Please don't tell anybody. The uh, people may get nervous that they're listening all the way out in Nairobi. So um, let's first understand. The Jewish people left Egypt, and they traveled through the wilderness for 40 years. Now, how do they, where do they stay? I mean, there was no Motel 6, there was no Hilton chain, there was not even, you know, the Walt of Astoria. So how, how did they uh, keep, uh, how did they shelter themselves? Well, there was what is known as Anania covered, clouds of glory. These were miraculous clouds that protected the Jewish people as they traveled through the wilderness. It protected them from uh, surrounding enemies, from the weather, all kinds of things happened th- thanks to these clouds of glories. And so, the, um, to remember that, the, uh, throughout, uh, we have a holiday of Sukkot, where we go outside and we s- in, sit in these, these booths to remember how these clouds of glory protected us during those 40 years, uh, the, the sojourn in the 40 years to the Promised Land. And the question we're asking this morning is, is uh, there were many other miracles that God provided us in the wilderness. Manna from heaven, the well of Miriam. This was a rock that spewed forth fresh drinking water for the Jewish nation to drink for while they were in the, in the desert. So our question, generally speaking, and I'm going to share a number of aspects and a number, number of uh, insights, but why are the clouds of glory the only miracle that merits its own holiday. We don't have a holiday to remember the manna from heaven or a, the holiday of the, a holiday to remember the miracle water that provided us through the merit of Miriam. So why do we have, why do we have the holiday of Sukkot to remember the miracle of these protective clouds of glory? And if you want to put it into, into a little further, historically speaking, when was those cl- when did those first uh, the clouds of glory first begin to protect us when we left Egypt, which would be in the month of Nisan, right after the holiday of Passover time? So why is it? Why aren't we celebrating the the sitting in the sukkah and remembering this miracle right after Passover? Why do we have this holiday during the fall? Right, it's a little cooler now. It's much later. Why do we have this holiday following the high holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? Let me just say hello to everybody uh, uh, watching us and see, make sure I've got everybody. So, yes, thank you. So, um, 
to, fu- to fully understand the answer to this question, um, we have to understand a little more deeper why we commemorate these special clouds at all. You must understand, why, 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 why celebrate this? What, what's there to celebrate? I mean, uh, okay, we have a general question, why not other miracles? But let's talk about this. Why are we even celebrating this concept? The answer is these protective clouds of glory were not there all the time in the initial stages. You see, once there was the sin of the golden calf, we came out of Egypt and we came to Mount Sinai and there, was the cl- there were the clouds of glory. But then came the, the event of the golden calf and those clouds of glory were actually removed. So after the transgression of the golden calf and Moses had to go up for 40 days to, beg for, to beg for forgiveness, part of that, of course, was the fact that there was no more clouds of glory. Now, he was successful in this 40-day trip up the mountain because when he came down, we received the second set of the tablets, which is, of course, the holiday of Yom Kippur. We also received God's one message, Solachti, that God had forgiven us for the sin. And three, and most importantly, in reflection to this complete forgiveness, there was the return of the clouds of glory, which represented a reconciliation between God and ourselves. So now we can understand why we specifically celebrate the clouds of glory versus all the other miracles that happened in the wilderness. When Moses came down with the good news that we were forgiven for the golden calf, we could have been worried that the relationship would not be the same as before. Right? So by God returning the clouds, it taught us an important message of the concept of forgiveness. You see, it was such a full, complete forgiveness that as if it never happened before. Things were like the way before. And this was symbolized by the return of the clouds of glory, like there was before. Therefore, Sukkot celebrates a complete reconciliation represented by these clouds of glory. When did they return? On the 15th day of Tishrei, which of course is tonight, tomorrow. That is why Sukkot is commemorated in the fall, because the the actual clouds of glory are reflective of something much deeper than simply another miracle. It represents a reconciliation. And certainly this is the time of the year from Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur where we come to a, a deeper appreciation, a reconciliation with our relationship with God and of course our relationship with each other. So there were many other miracles but the return of the clouds of glory signify a restoration of a closeness to ourselves, the Almighty God. Let's think about ourselves as well, what the lesson has to us as well. There are unfortunate times in, the, in our, all of our lives where we get wronged by someone else, whether it be at home, in the workplace, or the community. People say or do wrong things to us. It's very painful to forgive. So we find, somehow we find a way to pick up the pieces and move on. Yet we can never seem to be going back the way it is. Something in our mind, you know, keeps on reoccurring. Our reaction is the same. Do you have any idea of what he has done to me? Oh, I mean, I guess I sort of forgive him, but we can never get back to being friends again. Like we say, we we can forgive, but we don't forget. So along comes this holiday of Sukkot that we begin this evening and reminds us to forgive our fellow man in the same way God forgave us. What exactly is Sukkot? It emulates God's example of how we should deal with hurt, pain, and betrayal with one word, Salahti. That's what God said to Moses, I've forgiven you. Let us not only superficially forgive our man, our fellow man, for all the wrong wrongdoings they may have caused us, but to find the emotional strength within ourselves to fully forgive to the point as if we were never even wrong to begin with. That's quite a, quite a uh, high level. So this is one way of looking at the reason why we would celebrate it at this time of the year and why... why um, it happened, why we do it this particular time of the year and what the deeper meaning is, why we would celebrate this miracle as opposed to the other miracles during the uh, sojourn in the wilderness. I'd like to take you on another perspective as well. Because as I said, and I share with my wonderful congregation, whoever I can, it's very, it's very sad to see that we make a great effort to be in the synagogue, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and etc. and all the psalmists. But there really is a a very joyous side. And part of the importance of celebrating Sukkot coming out of the high holiday seasons is to celebrate life. 
in a moment. Let me just say hello to Holly Kyron. Thank you so much. Um, and to Doug. Thank you so much. Um, so, of course, Dr. Kildare, better known as Dr. Kilshevsky, wants to know why would we want to sit outside during the cold and not in the spring? And that's a question that the uh, Code of Jewish Law asks. And the answer is that the, um, if we did it in the springtime, a person goes outside and sits in this hut, we would, we would never know that we're doing it for the mitzvah because it's nice. Like, like the old-time holiday, what they call the Florida rooms. It's nice and cool, nice and, uh, you know, it's nice to go outside in that time of the year. But to go out when it's cool, ah, you're showing you're doing it for the mitzvah and not just doing it for your own personal, uh, you know, uh, personal comfort. Um, so uh, let's, let's continue now. The second reason as well, when, now that you're uh, this part of the program, we understand why we do this time of the year. It has nothing to do with the period so much of the time of the year, but really it reflects the reconciliation that's very much part of the whole season of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and the return of the clouds of glory was a reflection of how God had forgiven us, and for us to learn how we must forgive each other. Now, let's take another view on this same, on this, um, same, same issue. Again, the question is, why exactly do we celebrate it this time of the year? And really, it's a question not only to be asked about Sukkot. See, all other festivals are linked to a specific time in Jewish history. Passover, for example, commemorates the exodus from Egypt, which actually took place on the 15th day of the month of Nisan. So we celebrate it on the, every year on the 15th day of Nisan. Shavuot, which commemorates the giving of the Torah, took place on the 6th day of the Jewish month of Sivan. So whenever the 6th day of Sivan rolls around, Wherever we are in the world, we get ready to eat cheesecake, stay up all night learning, and, of course, we celebrate the giving of the Torah Mount Sinai. Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, falls on the first two days of the Jewish New Year, so for obvious reasons. But the timing of Sukkot is less apparent. The Gemara tells us, the Talmud tells us, we sit in our Sukkot on this festival to celebrate the miraculous clouds of glory that protected us for 40 years, providing us from shelter, from the elements, cover from the enemies as we travel through the hostile terrain of the desert. So clearly then, Sukkot is not a commemoration of a single event, but a state of divine protection, which spanned over 40 years. So why now? You know, um, why this particular time of the year? I'm now giving us a, a, a nor, another deeper side, and hopefully we'll come away today with an appreciation of the overall relationship with all the mitzvahs, all the holidays that we have during this time of the year. Let's think about this. We've just had Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Sukkot comes just a few days after Yom Kippur, right? After which, there's not going to be another Jewish holiday for six months. Of course, there's going to be the holiday of Hanukkah and my Hanukkah Talathon, and that's certainly a very highlight. But honestly, though, between after this holidays, these holidays, we, the next time, big major holiday is going to be... Um, it's going to be a, P- a Passover. Seeing that Sukkot is just as pertinent any other time of the year, why isn't the Jewish calendar spaced out more evenly? Why aren't we celebrating Sukkot three months from now, rather than the thick of this intense concentration of so many festivals? It would also make the rabbi's job a little easier. The key to answering this question lies in the integral connection between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur on the one hand and Sukkot on the other. Hang in with me, dear friends. It's a very deep idea. To understand that connection, we need to delve into the nature of the four species that we take in hand in Sukkot. As you may know, of course we all know, that during the week of Sukkot, even as we sit in a Sukkot for eating and for drinking, we also make a daily blessing on four species. We take an etrog, which is a fruit of the citron tree, a lulav, which is a date palm branch, hadas is a leafy bough from a myrtle tree, and Arava, which is a leafy branch from a willow tree, we take all of these four together and make a blessing. So on each day of, the, of Sukkot, we bring these four species together, we make a dedicated blessing, and shake them in a specific way. We shake it to the right, we shake it to the left, up, down, all around. That's why we call it the, the Lulav Shake. Our sages asked, why, what's the common denominator in the requirements of these four of these species? We know we bring them together because they are so different. 
Each one is different. The, uh, the asterisk, for example, the citrus fruit, has smell and taste. The lulav has taste and no smell. The arava has no smell and no taste. And the hadas has smell and no taste. So they're all different in taste and smell and structure. But there is one requirement that is common to all of them. And this, this is highlighted by a great sage, Rabbi Rabbeinu Bachai, explains that the common denominator of these four species that they're all connected to water. He says they are fresh throughout the year and, very, and a very important requirement of them to be fresh for use during the mitzvah of Sukkot. And the Talmud explains that if your lulav is dried out, you cannot use it. You cannot fill the mitzvah. So too with the etrog, the arava, hadas. There's something about these four that brings them together, the freshness. And the freshness that relates to water. So a really important shared requirement of all these four species is freshness. A connection to a water source. That remaining life liquid, giving liquid within each of them is an integral part of of the fulfillment of this mitzvah on Sukkot. But why? What does this water represent? What is this liquid, this juice within them, and what does it mean to us? And the rabbi, Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar, explains, it represents life. Life. When we bring these four species together, we celebrate and give thanks to the Almighty God for the fact that we are more alive than ever. And we are saying that we are now ready to dedicate that life to the Almighty God in His infinite wisdom and kindness. So now we can understand, dear friends, the connection between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur becomes so clear. On Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, what have we been praying for? So many things. We pray for a good year, for a sweet year. We pray for all of God's blessings. But most importantly, we pray for life itself. What is, what is the most uh, w- continuous words that we say throughout the, the services? We ask Hashem, who desires life, to remember Sahreinu Lachaim. Write us for, for life. Write us in the book of life. Remember us for life. Chaim, 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 life, life, to life, to life, Lachaim. Now you know why I was not hired as, a high, as the cantor for this year. So over and over again we say these words. That's what we've been praying for. Because we never take its privilege for granted. So, along comes Sukkot, immediately after the holiday of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. And you know what we give thanks for? For the very fact that we are alive. For the fact that we have breath in our lungs and energy in our bodies. That is what we are thankful for. And that is why we bring together the four species as fresh as can be. Filled with as much moisture as possible. And we thank God for the life that He's given us. And we say, Shech Thank you God who sustained us and kept us alive to reach this point. This sukkah, as we bring together, and I invite everyone to join us in the sukkah, we have services both Monday and Tuesday at 10 a.m., and we go out to the sukkah, and we all give an opportunity. Even if you cannot come for the services, just stop by, and we will help you make the blessing over these four species and to recognize the life, the new life, the freshness, and the enthusiasm that we have in the coming year. So we bring these four species together, recognizing and celebrating the infinite gift of life, we're reminded of when, when we hold the love and estrogen. Let us dedicate ourselves to this source of life and blessings and gratitude to the Almighty God. Interesting also, the four kinds represent our, our bodies. The uh, lulav, the, the uh, branch, represents our spine. The etrog is our heart. The uh, arava is our mouth. And the hadas is our eyes. And we ask asking God in this new year that we, we should have life, full health in our spine, in the way we stand and what we see, and what we say, and how we feel. Now, I want to move to a little concluding aspect, which I find very fascinating, very moving to me. Interestingly, on Simchas Torah, we conclude the reading of the five books of Moses. Big celebration. It's in the last eight sentences that we have a following problem, following interesting question. Who wrote the final verses of the Torah? Our tradition maintains that Moses wrote the Torah. But if you read, look into those last eight sentences, it talks about, describes Moses' death and burial. So the Talmud asks the question, how can a living Moses write the words and Moses died? Come on. 
I want to uh, say hello. Let me just uh, pause for a moment and thank everybody joining us. Let's see who has joined us. We want to say hello to Jill. Thank you. To Harold Kornfeld from Florida. And thank you. Jonathan Wolf. good morning to you. Mazel tov again. And um, so remember, everyone, there's going to be a big barbecue on this coming Thursday evening at 5.30. No charge at Al-Chabad in Mineola. Please join us. Music, guest speakers, great barbecue to celebrate the holiday of Sukkot together. So um, my question is this. How could Moses, the last eight sentences, talk about Moses, be written by Moses when it talks about Moses dying? And the Talmud gives us different opinions. Two rabbis say that the last eight verses were really not written by him. They were written by his disciple and successor, Joshua. Okay, makes sense. Okay, so last eight sentences he wrote, God dictated what he should write, and he recorded how Moses died. Along comes another rabbi, Rabbi Shimon. He disagrees. He says, impossible. It's, the Torah tells us Moses presented the Torah to all the, the 12 tribes. He didn't give them a, 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 you know, an unfinished one. He gave him a complete one, which would indicate that somehow Moses was connected to those last eight sentences. The question is, how could it be a complete Torah if it's talking about you know, he, that he died? So he answers that the, in the last eight sentences, he wrote with tears which is a rather haunting interpretation, mean that the teacher, our ever leader Moses, performed a last heartbreaking mission before his death. He recorded his own death. The question is, but how does that answer the question? If he was alive, how could he write those words and he, and he died? You know, how does it fit in? So the Mashal explains a fascinating insight, and you'll see why I'm sharing this with you today. The Talmud says that he wrote it with tears wasn't meaning that he wrote it while he was crying he means he wrote those words those last eight sentences with tears instead of ink so while the entire Torah was written with ink on parchment these final eight verses that tell about the story of Moses passing were transcribed not with ink but with tears with Moses tears and later on Joshua came and filled it in so there was the outline you could say like the, 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 uh, the areas were wetted by his tears and then later on it was filled in. So most of the Torah was written in ink and the final verses, the last words that Moses wrote constitute a Torah of tears. So what's this all about? And the Mashoga explains. Why would he write these words that did not happen yet? That was, so he wrote invisibly about his death. This sort of writing with tears isn't permanent. It's more abstract, if they're real. So it could have been written even before uh, before uh, the actual passing. So the tears functions as, as a kind of invisible ink. They made an imprint on the Torah, but, they, but they, they would be needed to be revealed later on with ink over time. So according to this concept, Moses wrote the verses in tears, and Joshua completed the task, not empty, empty sentences, but sentences that were written with this invisible ink, so to speak, the tears. After which, well, after he passed away, Joshua now filled in with ink, completing the Torah scroll. What, what is it all about? What, what do we learn from all of this? Why would this be? Why go through this whole effort? There's a profound message over here. That Moses' final gift was this complex rendering of his own death. To those who say that Moses cried his way through to the end, it seems that Moses left an important legacy of tears. After all the talk, so to speak, face to face, the promises, the stories, the laws, the agonies, and the miracles, the greatest lesson of all that Moses models to us is how to cry to Hashem, how to render oneself raw, vulnerable, and real. Talmud tells us, every gate has been locked except for the gate of tears. Standing that gate, Moses teaches us in his final moments, and he went out of his way to create a, an invisible writing, but with tears. No matter where one finds oneself, no matter how despairing one might feel, one is at the end of one's rope, so to speak. Moses is about to pass away. No matter how close one lies to the end, physically or mentally, God hears and absorbs the tears of those who call to him. It's an amazing concept. 
Isn't this true of our lives? All of us, in a sense, like a letter in the, in the Sefer Torah. Each of us are required in the course of our life to add another chapter to the scroll of Jewish history. Each of us are summoned to write the next chapter. Life is a powerful play, and, and we must contribute our verses. Let's, let's be honest with ourselves. Some of our chapters are written in ink, but others are written in tears, and with tears. And how do, you de- so how do we describe our relationship to our mother, our father, our grandparents, our siblings, our aunts, our grandparents, our siblings, aunts and aunts, your best friends, or, heaven forbid, a departed child or grandchild? How do you describe the void that death imprinted in your heart? How do you recall their final moments here on earth when, you, when they gave you that last gaze? When you looked at them for the last time before you had to say goodbye? How do you describe the moment you watched the earth swallow up a person you loved so dearly? Along comes Moses and gives us this formula. He taught us that some verses of life must not be written with ink, but with tears. It happened to me in the synagogue this high holidays. Someone came over to me, I not mentioned his name, and he mentioned something that goes through his mind when he thinks of his relatives who passed away. His eyes were filled with tears. So it wasn't what he was saying, it was also the tears. Sometimes tears are the only fair language to capture the sheer magnitude, enormity, depth, and the mystery of the moment. Tears are the language of our internal child who cannot make sense of the magnitude of life, of love and pain. This was the language of Moses when he came face to face with the greatest mystery of all. The transition from this world to the next and the need to say goodbye to a world and the people that he lived with. Tears are the necessary language when we're steer, staring at things that can't be grasped with our mathematical brains. Tears embody the language of surrender to the uh, indescribable. It is the language of intimacy with the infinite mystery of life and death. When what we need are, are not explanations, but to be held by God in, our, in His arms. As a mother holds a sobbing child, and the infant feels comforted, even if understands nothing. These are not always tears of sadness, my friend. There are often tears that we deal with stemming from an awareness of an infinite grandness of the moment. Sometimes we're going to have tears of joy. Once Simchas Torah, in 1986, I remember the Rebbe was speaking about Moses' love for his people. He was talking about Moses' love for his people. And the Rebbe cried for 30 minutes in front of 7,000 people, sobbing uncontrollably. These were tears, not of sadness, but tears of, of awareness, of infinite appreciation. So there are chapters in everyone's, in our own life, that we experience are written with tears. It can be tears of joy, tears of gladness, tears of awe, tears of gratitude, tears of ecstasy, tears of facing the infinite mystery. And that's what Moses taught us towards the end of his life. Do we really understand our life? Some, cha- some chapters are clear, written, black on white, so to speak, while others are wrapped and wrapped in confusion, uncertainty, mystery, powerful questions and doubt. But dear friends, it's all part of Torah. It's all part of our life. Some parts of our life we can figure out. Sometimes we can't figure it out and we leave it to the tears. It's up to us. So my friends, everything really is all part of one Torah. The scroll of life, like the scroll of of God that needs to be deciphered, decoded, and sometimes we can actually find deep meaning in that aspect of life too. This is your host Rabbi Pearl. Wish you a good circus. All the best. Hug some air. Thank you for joining us, both listening and those online. Take care, everybody. Take care.